Hello, hello, hello! Greetings, salutations, Konnichiwa, and every other form of green across this vast, marvelous multiverse. I am Matsu Quinox. This is Horus, and welcome back, my dear, marvelous, wonderful scholars, to the study. Hello there, hello there, hello there, hello there. Hello there, Yulian20. Congratulations on getting first. Hello there, Dr. Zadium. Welcome. And hello, all you marvelous, wonderful, fantastic scholars. All of you who may be watching, lurking, or whatever that is in between. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, and of course, we must give a warm welcome to our newest scholar, Thank you for the follow, Shellshock Prime. It's wonderful to have you as part of the study. So, my dear scholars, oh my goodness, a seven stream streak, Yulian20. Oh, congratulations, impressive. How are all you fine scholars doing this wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever it is, whenever it is across this multiverse? Yulian20, I owe you, owe me a bug. I know I owe you a bug. I will eat you, eat a bug. Just remind me when you want me to eat the bug, and I will eat it. Oh my goodness. Oh. oh my goodness, my dear scholars. Okay, you want a cricket. When when do you want me to eat this cricket? Tell me when you want me to eat it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to have to pull this stuff out. Soon, um, just tell me when you want me to do it. Uh, <laughs> of course, first thing off the bat, I'm eating bugs. All right, my dear scholars. Um, I guess we're gonna eat bugs right off the bat. Oh my goodness, they have eyes. <laughs> um, okay, so cricket then. Uh, which flavor? We have sour cream and onion. We have salt and vinegar, and we have bacon and cheese. Which one? Salt and vinegar. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm going to get the water ready just in case. Uh, I hope this doesn't... I hope this doesn't start my gag reflex. Oh my goodness. Horace, why did I let them do this to me? So for that note, um, we are we only do one bug a stream if possible. Oh my goodness! I wish I could, you could see this. These crickets are whole. I mean, they're they're not like bits and pieces of cricket. They are complete crickets, eyes and all. Oh, congratulations on the. Uh, oh my goodness! Uh, I I I can't open this. Oh, this is hard to open the package. Oh, I'm already regretting this. I mean, the mealworms were one thing, but crickets, they look... Oh my goodness. I gotta just grab one. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Just the feel of it in my hand. Make sure to savor it. It has eyes. It has eyes. Oh, it smells like salt and vinegar. You definitely smell the vinegary taste. Vinegar. All right, I'm about to eat a salt and vinegar cricket. Just for you, Yulian20. Just for you. I'm scared. I'm honestly scared of this. Getting stuck, my bits and pieces getting stuck. Mmm! Wow! Ah! It's not bad! It's actually pretty good! Mmm! Oh my goodness! The vinegar's really actually. It's kind of good! Yeah! It doesn't taste too bad! 
I'm surprised. I, I was convinced the vinegar flavor was going to do something big, but the vinegar actually adds to it. it it's nice and tangy. Mm. Mm, I like it, actually. Yeah, I ate the whole thing in one go. It, it tastes good. It actually tastes good. I kind of like that. I'm surprised. Oh my goodness, I got some stuck in my throat. But no, it wasn't bad. It 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 again, like the mealworms, it's a lot of um it's very chewy. Um it doesn't have the nutty flavor like the mealworms did. It um it's sour. It has a very sour flavor. It's crunchy like um you know how when you eat pop... I think I mentioned this with the mealworms. You know how you when you eat popcorn, you get those little bits of kernel left over? And they crunch and they get kind of stuck between your teeth and they're kind of empty? It's that same texture. Oh my goodness. I, I, there's a little bit of interesting aftertaste. I can definitely tell the vinegar in it. But it, it doesn't... It tastes good. I like it. I actually kind of like it. I'm, I am shocked. Mmm. Mm. Oh my goodness. Mm. I like the vinegar. Oh. I am so shocked by that. Because <laughs> I think I think when Sophia... I sh I'll have to ask Sophia when I see her again. But I think when Sophia did the salt and vinegar crickets, she didn't like it. But these actually taste good. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It's really good. So yes, that's our bug for the evening. Oh my goodness. Thank you for the suggestion, Yulian20. Inadvertently, you picked out a really good insect. Oh my goodness. Oh, Dr. Zadium does not like that, does he? Oh. Anyway, oh my goodness. Um. So, my dear scholars, tonight, <laughs> on that note... On the note of eating bugs, tonight we are back to reading. Ah, oh, excited. And we are reading a classic. I mean, they're all classics, but this one, oh. And this was a suggestion, actually a request from so Sophia. Tonight we are going to be reading Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. I'm sure all of you have heard of Robin Hood in some way. Mm. I, I mean, I would be surprised if you didn't know about Robin Hood. Or at least seen a movie about Robin Hood. But um, this book is uh, one of the one of the old... I think this is one of the first collections of... Pro well, not the first collections. Um, it was originally published... When was this published? Oh my goodness, it doesn't mention the publishing date. Um, give me a second, my dear scholars. Um, 1883 was when it was originally published. It was one of the first compilations of Robin Hood um, stories. So it, it's 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 an adaptation of traditional stories which have been flowing around all over the place. Because Robin Hood, of course, was a character who there were a lot of tales of, a lot of variations. And Howard Pyle basically took as many as he could find and just kind of mashed them together into a coherent narrative. Private Mac Disney, Kevin Costner, Men in Tights, yeah, I heard of the guy. <laughs> I think most people have. Uh, fun fact, there are actually two... Disney Robin Hood films. There's the animated one, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. And then there was a live-action one called um, uh, Robin Hood and His Merry Men, which was made in the 1950s. That one doesn't get noticed a lot, surprisingly. Kind of surprised. Well, kind of surprised. Yeah, that one doesn't get mentioned a lot. It's an okay one. But it has some some interesting points to it. But tonight we will be reading the book. I've got a nice hardcover copy of it. Mm. <laughs> so I am really excited to read this. 
and thank you, Sophia, for suggesting it. We'll see if we'll um if we'll continue to be uh, appreciating that. So then, my dear scholars, shall we begin our reading of Robin Hood and his adventures? In the t <laughs> and his adventures with his merry men. <laughs> I will take that as a yes. So sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking, and let us begin our. Oh, oh, oh! My goodness. Thank you for the raid, Ike. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's give a shout out. Because I think my... Uh, I think my mod is not here at the moment. So, Ike. Um, what were you playing tonight or doing tonight? Hello there, Isaiah. Welcome. You're just in time. We were just about to start our read of Robin Hood. Catboy Raid. You also missed me eating a cricket. Oh, still stuck in my throat a little bit. <laughs> well, welcome, dear raiders. I am Matsu Quinox, interdimensional omniversal librarian. And this is my dear companion, friends, and friend, and, uh, well, assistant, Horace. Cool skeleton. Hello, I see I joined right after raid. It say, oh, yummy crickets. The cricket was actually pretty good. It was salt and vinegar flavor. It, it tasted actually pretty good. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to taste so good. I just said good three times, so it must, so it must be good. Ike, new game, fun game. And Issa said she would be awake at noon tomorrow for another stream. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful to hear that. Oh, Always glad to hear from you, too. So then, we are just about to start the story. So, my dear scholars, sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking, and let us begin our reading. Cool skill, I'm going to put you in the background while I work on some stuff. All right, that's fair. I, Castro, I was playing Phantom Brigade. Oh, sounds interesting. Well, that sounds exciting. So I'll say it again. Let's sit back, relax, have a hot or cold beverage of your liking, dim the lights, and let us re begin our reading of Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. Isao, I said I would play with him on stream. I made no promise about waking up and doing like 19 hours and two days. Wow. Wow. So just a warning ahead of time, the book is written in a very archaic manner to fit in with that old Merry England sort of vibe that uh, Howard Pyle was trying to, trying to um, copy. <coughs> Prologue. In Merry England in the time of old, when good King Henry II ruled the land, there lived within the green glades of Sherwood Forest, near Nottingham Town, a famous outlaw whose name was Robin Hood. No archer ever lived that could speed a grey goose shaft with such skill and cunning as his, nor were there ever such yeomen as the seven score merry men that roamed with him through the greenwood shades. Right merrily they dwelt within the depths of Sherwood Forest, suffering neither care nor want, but passing the time in merry games of archery or bouts of cudgel play, living upon the king's venison, washed down with draughts of ale of October brewing. Not only Robin himself, but all the band were outlaws, and dwelt apart from other men, yet they were beloved by the country people round about, for no one ever came to Jolly Robin for help in time of need, and went away again with an empty fist. Now, this might surprise you, my dear scholars, I'll pause, that most of you remember Robin Hood as being in the time of King Richard. 
as well as Prince John being his eternal foe. But in the original stories, they kind of waffled on who the king was. Later on, they kind of settled on King Richard as being the um, the nearest uh, nearest monarch to fit the bill. But in some of them, like this one, they chose King Henry II instead, who was um, an earlier king, I believe. Where was I? And now I will tell you, and now I will tell how it first came about that Robin Hood fell afoul of the law. When Robin was a youth of eighteen, stout of sinew and bold of heart, the sheriff of Nottingham proclaimed a shooting match and offered a prize of a butt of ale to whomsoever should shoot the best shaft in Nottinghamshire. Now, quoth Robin, Will I go too, for fain would I draw a string for the bright eyes of my lass, and a butt of good October brewing. So up he got and took his good stout U-bow, and a score or more of broad cloth yard arrows, and started off from Loxley Town, through Sherwood Forest, to Nottingham. It was at the dawn of day in the merry May time, when hedgerows are green and flowers bedeck the meadows, Daisies pied and yellow cuckoo buds and fair primroses all along the briery hedges. When apple buds blossom and sweet birds sing. The lark at dawn of day, the throstle cock and cuckoo. When lads and lasses look upon each other with sweet thoughts. When busy housewives spread their linen to bleach upon the bright green, green grass. Sweet was the green wood as he walked along its paths and bright the green and rustling leaves amid which the little bird sang with might and main, and blithely Robin whistled as he trudged along, thinking of Maid Marian and her bright eyes, for at such time a youth's thoughts are wont to turn pleasantly upon the lass he loves the best. So in this version he already knows Maid Marian, apparently from a young age. As thus he walked along with a brisk step and a merry whistle, he came suddenly upon some foresters seated beneath a great oak tree. Fifteen there were in all, making themselves merry with feasting and drinking as they sat around a huge pasty, to which each man helped himself, thrusting his hands into the pie and washing down that which they ate with great horns of ale, which they drew all foaming from a barrel that stood nigh. Each man was clad in Lincoln green, and a fine show they made, see it upon the sward beneath that fair spreading tree. Then one of them, with his mouth full, called out to Robin, Hello! Where goest thou, little lad, with thy one penny bow and thy farthing shafts? Then Robin grew angry, for no stifling likes to be taunted with his green years. Now, quoth he, my bow and eck mine arrows are as good as thine, and moreover I go to the shooting match at Ro Nottingham Town, which shall ha which sh same has been proclaimed by our good sheriff of Nottinghamshire. There I will shoot with other stout yeomen, for a prize has been offered of a fine butt of ale. Then one who held a horn of ale in his hand said, Ho, listen to the lad! Why, boy, thy mother's milk is yet scarce dry upon thy lips, and yet thou prattest of standing up with good stout men of Nottingham butts, thou who art scarce able to draw one string of a tuned stone bow. I'll hold the best of you twenty marks, quoth bold Robin, that I hear the clout at three score rods, by the good help of our lady fair. At this all laughed aloud, and one said, Well boasted, thou fair infant, well boasted, and well thou knowest that no target is nigh to make good thy wager. And another cried, He'll be taking ale with his milk next. At this Robin grew right mad. Hark ye, said he, 
Yonder at the glade's end I see a herd of deer, even more than three score rods distant. I'll hold you twenty marks that by leave of our lady I cause the best heart among them to die. No done! cried he who had spoken first. And here are twenty marks. I wager that thou cause no beast to die, with or without the aid of our lady. Then Robin took his good yew bow in his hand, and placing the tip at his instep, he strutted right deftly, that he rocked, that he knocked a broad cloth yard arrow, and raising the bow, drew the grey goose feather to his ear. The next moment, the bowstring rang and the arrow sped down the glade as a sparrowhawk skims in a northern wind. High leaped the noblest heart of all the herd, only to fall dead, reddening the green path with his heart's blood. Ha! cried Robin. How likest thou that shot, good fellow? I wot the wager was were mine, and it were three hundred pounds. Then all the foresters were filled with rage, and he who had spoken the first and had lost the wager were more angry than all. Nay, cried he, the wager is none of thine, and get thee gone straight away, over all the saints of heaven, I'll bast thy, thy sides until thou wilt neither be able to walk again. Knowest thou not, said another, that thou hast killed the king's deer? And by the laws of our gracious lord and sovereign, King Harry, thine ears should be shaven close to thine head. Now that's a thing you should know. Um, back then, I'm gonna get a drink of water. Basically, almost all the countryside belonged to the king, the forest did at least. So going out and shooting a deer in the forest was a capital offense. Which you could be, um, at the severest, I believe you could be outlawed for it. Um, it was considered the king's property, and in order to hunt in the forests, you would have to be given a special royal um, license to be able to go into the forest to hunt the king's property. And that's um, actually somewhat where uh, the idea of hunting licenses come from. You basically are given a hunting license to go out and hunt on the property belonging to the monarch. Private Maverick. He dared to king a king's <laughs> I don't know if that counts as a pun or not, but that is funny. <coughs> Catch him! cried a third. Nay! said a fourth, let him uh, go because of his tender years. Never a word said Robin Hood, but he looked at the foresters with a grim face, then turning on his heel strode away from them down the forest glade. But his heart was bitterly angry, for his blood was hot and youthful and prone to boil. Now, well would it have been for him who had first spoken had he left Robin Hood alone. But his anger was hot, both because the youth had gotten the better of him, and because of the deep draught of droughts of ale that, have, that he had been quaffing. So of a sudden, without any warning, he sprang to his feet and seized upon his bow and fitted it to a shaft. Aye, cried he, and I'll hell thee anon and he sent the arrow whistling after Robin. It was well for Robin Hood that that same forester's head was spinning with ale, or else he would never have taken another step. As it was, the arrow whistled within three inches of his head. <coughs> Excuse me. Then he turned around and quickly drew his own bow and sent an arrow back in return. Ye said I was no archer! cried he aloud, but say so now again. The f shaft flew straight. The archer fell forward with a cry and lay on his face upon the ground, his arrows rattling about him from out of his quiver, the gray goose staff wet with his heart's blood. Then before the others could gather their wits about them, Robin Hood was gone into the depths of the greenwood. 
Some started after him, but not with much heart, for each feared to suffer the death of his fellow. So presently they all came and lifted the dead man up and bore him away to Nottingham Town. Meanwhile, Robin Hood ran through the greenwood. Gone with all, was all the joy and brightness from everything, for his heart was sick within him, and it was borne in upon his soul that he had slain a man. Alas, cried he, thou hast found me an archer that will make thy wife to ring. I would thy, I would thou, I would that thou hadst ne'er said one word to me, or that I had never passed thy way, or in thy, in that my right forefinger had been stricken off ere that this had happened. In hast I smote, the grieve I saw at leisure. And then, even in his trouble, he remembered the old saw that what is done is done, and the egg cracked cannot be cured. And so he came to dwell in the greenwood that was to be his home for many a year to come, never again to see the happy days with the lad and lads and lasses of sweet Loxley Town. For he was outlawed, not only because he had killed a man, but also because he had poached upon the king's deer, and two hundred pounds were set upon his head as a reward from who, for whomever would bring him to the court of the king. Now, it's important to know what exactly an outlaw is, my dear scholars. Um, an outlaw isn't necessarily simply just a robber or a criminal or anything. It actually really sucks being an outlaw. Um, being an outlaw essentially meant, as the name as the word suggests, it means you are outside the law, which means the law offers no protection to who you are. Once you are an outlaw, anyone could rob from you, could essentially kill you, could do anything, and they would not suffer any of the penalties of the law because you are outside the protection of the law. You are basically... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? You you are essentially... What was that horse? You essentially don't count in society anymore. Um, so being an outlaw is really an awful thing. That's why Robin Hood is kind of panicking. Yulian 20, time to go. Have a good read. Oh, thank you for coming, Yulian 20. And you have a wonderful time as well. But it, um, it does mean you are essentially outside the protection of the law. That's what being an outlaw means. It's not fun, and it is not glamorous. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the Sheriff of Nottingham swore that he himself would bring this knave, Robin Hood, to justice. And for two reasons. First, because he wanted the 200 pounds. And next, because the forester that Robin Hood had killed was of king, kin to him. But Robin Hood lay hidden in Sherwood Forest for one year, and in that time there gathered around him many others like himself, cast out from other folk for their cause, and for that, and for that. Ah, no. Cast out from other folk for this cause and for that. Some had shot deer in hungry winter time, when they could get no other food and had been seen in the act by the foresters, but had escaped, thus saving their ears. Some had been turned out of their inheritance, that their farms might be added to the king's lands in Sherwood Forest. Some had been despoiled by a great baron, or a rich abbot, or a powerful esquire. All for one cause or another had come to Sherwood to escape Ron in oppression. So in all that year, five score or more good stout yeomen gathered about Robin Hood and chose him to be their leader and chief. Then they vowed that even as they themselves had been despoiled, they would despoil their oppressors, whether baron, abbot, knight, or squire, and that from each they would take that which had been run from the poor by unjust taxes or land rents or in wrongful fines. But to the poor folk they would give a helping hand in need and trouble, 
and would return to them that which had been unjustly taken from them. Besides this, they swore never to harm a child, nor to run a woman, be she maid, wife, or widow. <coughs> Excuse me. So that, after a while, when the people began to find that no harm was meant to them, but that money or food came in time of want to many a poor family, they came to praise Robin and his merry men, and to tell many tales of him and of his doings in Sherwood Forest, for they felt him to be one of themselves. Up rose Robin Hood one merry morn, when all the birds were singing blithely among the leaves, and up rose all his merry men, each fellow washing his head and hands in the cold brown book that la leaped laughing from stone to stone. Then said Robin, For fourteen days have we seen no sport, so now I will go abroad to seek adventures from forthwith. But tarry ye, my merry men all, here in the greenwood, only see that ye mind well my call. Three blasts upon the bugle horn I will blow in my hour of need. Then come quickly, for I shall want your aid. So saying, he strode away through the leafy forest glades until he had come to the verge of Shorterwood. There he wandered for a long time through highway and byway, through dingy dell and forest skirts. Now he met a fair buxom lass in a shady lane, and each gave the other a merry word and passed away. Now he saw a fair lady upon an ambling pad, to whom he doffed his cap, and who bowed sedately in return to the fair youth. Now he saw a fat monk on a panner-laden ass, now a gallant knight with spear and shield and armor that flashed brightly in the sunlight, now a page clad in crimson, and now a stat burg burger from good Nottingham town, pacing along with serious footsteps. All these sights he saw, but adventures found he none. At last he took a road by the forest skirts, a by-path that dipped toward a broad, pebbly stream, spanned by a narrow bridge made of a log of wood. As he drew nigh this bridge, as he drew nigh this bridge, he saw a tall stranger coming from the other side. Thereupon Robin quickened his pace, as did the stranger likewise, each thinking to cross the first, to cross first. Now, stand thou back! quoth Robin, and let the better man cross first. Nay, answered the stranger, then stand back thine own self, for the better man I wot, I wot am I. That will, that, yeah, that will we presently see, quoth Robin, and meanwhile stand thou where thou art, or else by the bright bow of St. Alfred, I will show the right good Nottingham play with a cloth-yard shaft betwixt thy ribs. Now, quoth the stranger, I will tan thy hide till it be as many colours as a bagger's cloak. If thou darest so much as touch a strain of that same bow, bow that thou holdest in thy hands. Thou prattest like an ass, said Robin. For I could send this shaft clean through thy proud heart before a curtail friar could say grace over a roast goose at Michaelmas tide. And thou priest like a coward, answered the stranger, for thou standest there with a good yew bow to shoot at my heart, while I have not in my hand but a plain blackthorn staff wherewith to meet thee. Now, quoth Robin, by the faith of my heart, never have I had a coward's name in all my life before. I will lay by my trusty bow, and irk my arrows, and if thou darest bide, abide my coming, I will go and cut a cudgel to test thy manhood withal. withal. Ay, Mary, that will I abide thy coming, and joyously too, quoth the stranger, whereupon he leaned sturdily upon his staff to await Robin. 
Then Robin Hood stepped quickly to the cover side and cut a good staff of ground oak, straight and without straight without flaw and six feet in length, and came back trimming away the tender stems from it, while the stranger waited for him, leaning upon his staff and whistling as he gazed round about. Robin observed him fer fervently as he trimmed his staff, measuring him from top to toe from out the corner of his eye, and thought that he had never seen a lustier or a stouter man. Tall was Robin, but taller was the stranger by a head and a neck, for he was seven feet in height. Now, we're talking about Middle Ages England. So seven feet in height is absolutely gigantic. I'm sure you scholars can guess who this mysterious stranger is. Broad was Robin across the shoulders, but broader was the stranger by twice the breadth of a palm, which he measured at least an L around the, around the waist. Dr. Dr. Sadie of his Papa John. <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, this character is going to be talking about the uh, pizza, like what was it, the pizza apocalypse or something? I don't, I don't remember what it is. Horace knows what it is. I don't remember what it is. <laughs> Nevertheless, said Robin to himself, I will bast thy hide right merrily, my good fellow. Then aloud, Lo, here's my good staff, lusty and tough. Now wait my coming, and thou darest and meet me, and thou fearest not. Then we will fight until one or the other of us tumble into the stream by dint of blows. Mary, that meeteth my whole heart, cried the stranger, twirling his staff about above his head, betwixt his fingers and thumb until it whistled again. Dr. Sadium, the reckoning. Yes, the reckoning. This is the reckoning. <coughs> is he? Never did the knights of Arthur's round table meet in a stouter fight than did these two. In a moment, Robin stepped quickly upon the bridge where the stranger stood. First he made a feint, then delivered a blow at the stranger's head that, had it met its mark, would have tumbled him speedily into the water. But the stranger turned the blow right deftly, and in return gave one a stout, which Robin also turned as the stranger had done. So they stood each in their place, neither moving a finger's breadth back for one good hour, and many blows were given and received by each in their time, till here and there were sore bones and bumps, yet neither, neither thought of crying. D yeah. Yet neither thought of crying enough, or seemed likely to fall from off the bridge. Now and then they stopped to rest, and each thought that he never had seen it all his life before such a hand at quarterstaff. At last, Robin gave the stranger a blow upon the ribs that made his jacket smoke like a damp straw thatch in the sun. So shrewd was the stroke that the stranger came within a hair's breadth of falling off the bridge, but he regained himself right quickly, and by a dexterous blow gave Robin a crack on the crown that caused the blood to flow. Oh my goodness. Then Robin grew mad with anger and smote with all his might at the other, but the stranger warded the blow and once again thwacked Robin, and this time so fairly that he fell head o heels over head into the water as the queen pin falls in a game of bowls. And where art thou now, good lad? shouted the stranger, roaring with laughter. Oh, in the flood and floating a down with the tide, cried Robin. Nor could he forbear laughing himself at his sorry plight. Then, gaining his feet, he waded to the bank, the little fish speeding hither and thither, all frightened at his splashing. Give me thy hand! cried he when he had reached the bank. I must needs own thou art a brave and sturdy soul, and withal a good stout stroke of the cudgels. By this and by that my head hummeth like to a hive of bees on a hot June day. 
Then he clapped his horn to his lips and whined a blast that went echoing sweetly down the forest paths. I marry, quoth he again, thou art a tall lad and eke a brave one, for nigh, near, I trow, is there a man betwixt here and Canterbury Town could do like to me that thou hast done? And thou, quoth the stranger laughing, takest thy cudgeling like a brave heart and a stout yeoman. And now the distant twigs and branches rustled with the coming of men, and suddenly a score or two of good stout yeomen, all clad in Lincoln green, burst from out the co covert, with Mary Will Stutley at their head. Good master, cried Will, how is this? Truly thou art all wet from head to toe, and that to the very skin. Why, Mary, answered Jolly Robin, yon stout fellow hath tumbled me neck and crop into the water, and hath given me a drubbing beside. Then shall he not go without a ducking, and Eric a drubbing himself? cried Will Stutley. Have at him, lads! Then Will and a score of yeomen leaped upon the stranger. But though they sprang quickly, they found him ready, and felt him strike right and left with his stout staff, so that, though he went down with a press of, with press of numbers, some of them rubbed cracked crowns before he was overcome. Nay, forbear! cried Robin, laughing until his sore sides ached again. He is a right good man and true, and no harm shall befall him. Now hark ye, good youth, wilt thou stay with me and be one of my band? Three suits of Lincoln green shalt thou have each year, beside forty marks and fee, and share with us whatsoever good shall befall us. Thou shalt eat sweet venison, and quaff the stoutest ale, and mine own good right-hand man shalt thou be, for never did I see such a cudgel player in all my life before. Speak, wilt thou be one of my good merry men? That knew I not, quoth the stranger surely, for he was angry at being so tumbled about. If ye handle ye bow, an apple's shaft no better than ye do oaken cudgel, or what ye not are not fit to be called yeomen in my country. But if there be any man here that can shoot a better shaft than I, then will I bethink me of joining with you. Now by my face, said Robin, thou art a right saucy valet. Sirrah, 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 Ugh. sirrah, yet I will stoop to thee as, as I never stooped to man before. Good Studley, cut thou a fair white piece of bark, four fingers in breadth, and set it fourscore yards distant on yonder oak. Now, stranger, hit that fairly with a grey goose shaft, and call thyself an archer. Aye, many, that will I, answered he. Give me a good stout bow, bow and a fair broad arrow, and if I hit it not strip me, and beat me blue with bowstrings. Then he chose the stoutest bow amongst them all, next to Robin's own, and a straight grey goose shaft, well feathered and smooth, and stepping to the mark, while all the band sitting or lying upon the green sword watched to see him shoot, he drew the arrow to his cheek, and loosened the shaft right de deftly, saying it so straight down the path that it clove the mark in the very center. Aha! cried he, mend thou that if thou canst. While even the yeomen clapped their hands at so fair a shot. That is a keen shot indeed, quoth Robin. Mend it, I cannot. But mar it, I may, perhaps. Then taking up his own good stout bow, and knocking an arrow with care, he shot with his very greatest skill. Straight flew the arrow, and so true that it lit fairly upon the stranger's shaft and split it into splinters. Then all the yeomen leaped to their feet and shouted for joy that their master had shot so well. Now by the lusty you bow of good Saint Withhold, cried the stranger, that is a shot indeed, 
and never saw I the like in all my life before. Now truly will I thy man henceforth, and for I, good Adam Bill was a fair shot, but never shot he so. So this is a little note for you, and it's, it's um, it's quite interesting. So Adam Bell, the one they mentioned here, Adam Bell, Climb of the Cloth, and William of Claude Clodesley were three noted North Country bowmen whose names have been celebrated in many, many ballads of the olden time. In fact, Adam Bell was also an outlaw figure in uh, ballads. And there have been some, uh, like, I think there was one theory that that Robin Hood is simply in evolution of the character of Adam Bell. But, again, there's a lot of theories about Robin Hood. But it is worth noting that Adam Bell was another outlaw who used a bow and arrow. That I have, that I have gained a good right, a right good man this clay, quoth Jolly Robin. What name goest thou by, good fellow? Men call me John Little, whence I came, answered the stranger. Then Will Stutley, who loved a good jest, spoke up. Nay, fair little stranger said he, I like not thy name, and fain would I have it otherwise. Little art thou indeed, and small of bone and sinew, therefore shall thou be christened Little John, and I will be thy godfather. Then Robin Hood and all his band laughed aloud until the stranger began to grow angry. And thou make a jest to me, quoth he to Will Stutley. Thou wilt have sore bones and little pay, and that in short season. Nay, good friends, good friend, said Robin Hood, bottle thine anger, for the tame name fitteth, fitteth thee well. Little John shall thou be called henceforth, and little John shall it be. So come, my merry men, and we will go and prepare a christening feast for thy, this fair infant. So turning their backs upon the stream, they plunged into the forest once more, through which they traced their steps till they reached the spot where they dwelt in the depths of the woodland. There had they built huts of bark and branches of trees, and made couches of sweet rushes spread over, the, over with skins of fallow deer. Here stood a great oak tree with branches spreading broadly around, beneath which was a seat of green moss where Robin Hood was wont to sit at feast and at merrymaking with his stout men about him. Here they found the rest of the band, some of whom had, whom had, had, some of whom had come in with a brace of fat does. Then they all built great fires, and after a time roasted the doughs and broached a barrel of humming ale. Then when the feast was ready, they all sat down. But Robin Hood placed Little John at his right hand, for he was henceforth to be the second to the band. Then when the feast was done, Will Stutley spoke up. It is now time, I ween, to christen our bonny babe. Is it not so, many boys? And... Aye, aye, cried all, laughing till the woods echoed with their mirth. Then seven, seven sponsors shall we have, quoth Will Stutley, and hunted among all the band he chose the seven stoutest men of them all. Now, by St. Dunstan, cried Little John, springing to his feet, more than one of you shall rue it, and you lay finger upon me. But without a word, they all ran upon him at once, seizing him by his legs and arms and holding him tightly in spite of his struggles, and they bore him forth while all stood around to see the sport. Then one came forward who had been chosen to play the priest because he had a bald crown, and in his hand he carried a brimming pot of ale. Now who bringeth this babe? asked him right soberly. That do I! answered Will Stutley. Uh, what name calls thou him? 
Little John call I him? Now, Little John, quoth the mock priest, thou hast not lived heretofore, but only got thee along through the world. But henceforth thou wilt live indeed. When thou livest, not thou wast called John Little, but now that thou dost live indeed, Little John shalt thou be called. So christen I thee. And at these last words he emptied the pot of ale upon Little John's head. That seems like such a waste of ale. Then all shouted with laughter as they saw the good brown ale stream over Little John's beard and trickle from his nose and chin. <coughs> oh, excuse me. While his eyes blinked with the smart of it. At first he was of a mind to be angry, but found he could not because the others were so merry. So he too laughed with the rest. Then Robin took this sweet pretty babe, clothed him all anew from top in to toe in Lincoln Green, and gave him a good stout bow, and so made him a member of the merry band. And thus it was that Robin Hood became outlawed. Thus a band of merry companions gathered about him, and thus he gained his right-hand man, Little John. And so the prologue ends. And I will, t I will tell you how the Sheriff of Nineham three times sought to take Robin Hood, and how he failed each time. Now I should note that each of these chapters have little descriptives, which reveal what the chapter is about. I'm going to ask you, my dear scholars, do you want me to mention the little descriptive parts just before the chapters, or skip them? Because it's technically part of the chapter name, but it also gives away a lot of what's going on in the chapter. What say you, my dear scholars? I'm fine with either. They're saying, well, it was put there, and a regular reader would see it. Well, all right, then I shall do it. <coughs> I wish I could show you the illustrations of this book. They are absolutely gorgeous. Dr. Zayam, ooh, you should read those in radio voice. No, radio voice is for special purposes. You have to redeem a radio voice, otherwise it then becomes... Then it becomes not so special. If I do a radio voice for all of this, then when someone does a radio voice redeem, then it, you know, it takes away from the specialness of it. And, of course, Dr. Zadium redeems the radio voice. Do you want me to do the radio voice in the descriptive? <laughs> Is that what you want me to do for this descriptive? I'll do it for the part first part. Oh. Okay. Ahem. <laughs> Let me get a drink of water just to make sure that my voice is proper. Okay. Part first. Telling how the Sheriff of Nottingham swore that he would deal dole to Robin Hood. Also, how he made three trials thereat, but missed each time by a good bow's length. This is Radio Matsu, recording just for you, my dear scholars. I hope that you appreciate that. One, Robin Hood and the Tinker. Now, it was told before how 200 pounds were set upon Robin Hood's head, and how the Sheriff of Nottingham swore that he himself would seize Robin, both because he would fain have the 200 pounds, and because the slain man was a kinsman of his own. Now, the Sheriff did not yet know what a force Robin had about him in Sherwood, but thought that he might serve a warrant for his arrest, as he could upon any other man that had broken the laws. 
Therefore, he offered fourscore golden angels to anyone who would serve this warrant. But men of Nottingham Town knew more of Robin Hood and his doings than the sheriff did, and many laughed to think of serving a warrant upon the bold outlaw, knowing well that all they would get for their service would be cracked crowns, so that no one came forward to take the matter in hand. Thus a fortnight passed, in which time none came forward to do the sheriff's business. Then said he, Give me one second, uh, dear scholars, I have to come up with a voice for the sheriff. Okay. Then said he, A right good reward have I offered to whomsoever I would serve my warrant upon Robin Hood, and I marvel that no one has come to undertake the task. Then one of his men who was near him said, uh, Good master, thou wantest not the force that Robin Hood has about him, and how little he cares for warrant of king or sheriff. Truly, no one likes to go on this service for fear of cracked crowns and broken bones. Then I hold all Nottingham men to be cowards, said the sheriff, and let me see the man in all Nottinghamshire that dare disobey the warrant of our sovereign lord, King Harry, for by the shrine of St. Edmund I will hang him forty cubits high. But... If no man in Nottingham dare win fourscore angels, I will send elsewhere, for there should be men of metal somewhere in this land. Then he called up a messenger in whom he placed great trust, and bade him saddle his horse and make ready to go to Lincoln Town, to see whither he could find anyone there that would do his bidding, and win the reward. So that same morning the messenger started forth upon his errand. Bright shone the sun upon the dusty highway that led from Nottingham to Lincoln, stretching away all white over hill and dale. Dusty was the highway, and dusty the throat of the messenger, so that his heart was glad when he saw before him the sign of the Blue Boar Inn, when somewhat more than half his journey was done. The inn looked fair to his eyes, and the shade of the oak trees that stood around it seemed cool and pleasant, so he alighted from his horse to rest himself for a time, calling for a pot of ale to refresh his thirsty throat. There he saw a party of right jovial fellows seated beneath the spreading oak that shaded the green word in front of the door. There was a tinker, two barefoot friars, and a party of six of the king's foresters, all clad in Lincoln green, and all of them were quaffing humming ale, and singing merry ballads of the good old times. Loud laughed the foresters, as jests were banded about between the singing, and louder laughed the friars, for they were lusty men with beards that curled like the wool of black rams. But loudest of all laughed the tinker, and he sang more sweetly than any of the rest. His bag and his hammer hung upon a twig of the oak tree, and nearby leaned his good stout cudgel, as thick as his wrist, and nodded at the end. Come! cried one of the foresters to the tired messenger. Come join us for this shot! Ho, oh, landlord! Bring a fresh pot of ale for each man! The messenger was glad enough to sit down along with the others who were there, for his limbs were weary and the ale was good. No, what news bearest thou so fast? quoth one, and whither rise thou today? The messenger was a chatty soul, and loved a bit of gossip dearly. Beside the pot of ale warmed his heart, so that, settling himself in an easy corner of the inn bench, where the host leaned upon the doorway, and the hostess stood with her hands beneath her apron, he unfolded his budget of news with great comfort. Excuse me. 
He told all from the very first, how Robin Hood had slain the forester, and how he had hidden in the greenwood to escape the law, how, he, how that he lived therein, all against the law, God wot, slaying his majesty's deer, and levying toll on fat abbot, knight, and esquire, so that none dare travel even one broad watling street or the foss way for fear of him. How that the sheriff, heaven save his worship, who paid him, the messenger, sixpence every Saturday night of good broad money stamped with the king's head, beside ale at Michaelmas and a fat goose at Christmas tide, had a mind to serve the king's warrant upon this same rogue, though little would be mind either warrant of king or sheriff, for he was far from being a law-abiding man. Then he told how none could be found in all Nottingham town to serve what was I, to serve this warrant, for fear of cracked pates and broken bones, and how that he, the messenger, was now upon his way to Lincoln town to find of what metal the Lincoln men might be, and whither there were any there that dared serve this same warrant. Wherefore was he now seated, seated, sitting upon the prettiest lads he had ever known, and the ale was the best ale he had tasted in all his life. To this discourse they listened with open mouths and eyes, for it was a fair piece of gossip to them. Then when the messenger had done the jolly, done, the jolly tinker, broke silence. Another drink of water, because I got another voice to do. Let's see. Now come I, forsooth, from good Banbury town, said he, and no one nigh Nottingham nor Sherwood either, and that be the mark, can old cudgel with my crip. Boy, lads! Did I not meet that mad wag, Simon of Ill, even at the famous fair at Hartford Town? I beat him in the rain at that place before Sir Robert of Leslie and his lady. This same Robin Hood of whom I want, I never heard before, is a right merry blade. But gin he be strong, am I not stronger? And gin he be sly, am I not I, am not I slyer? Now by the bright eyes of none of the mill, and by mine old name, and that's what o' oh, the crab stuff, and by mine own mother's son, and that's myself will I, even I, what o' oh, the crab stuff, <laughs> meet the same sturdy rogue, and did he mind not the seal of our glorious sovereign, King Harry, and the warrant of the good sheriff of Nottinghamshire? I will so bruise, bait, and bemaul his pate, and that he shall never move finger or toe again. Hear ye that, bully boys? Come, let us have another bout. Now art thou... Now art thou the man for my farthing, cried the messenger. I don't know why I gave him such a squeaky voice. And back thou goest with me to Nottingham Town. Nay, quoth the tinker, shaking his head slowly from side to side. Go I with no man, chin I, it be not with mine own free will. Nay, nay said the messenger. No man is there in Nottinghamshire could make thee go against thy will, thou brave fellow. Boy, that, uh, that be I brave, said the tinker. I merry, said the messenger. Thou art a brave lad, but our good share of hath thou hath offered fourscore angels of bright gold to whosoever shall serve the warrant upon Robin Hood. Though little good will it do. Then I will go with thee, lad. Do but wait till I get my bag and hammer and my cudgel. Aye, let me but meet this same Robin Hood. Let me see whether he will not mind the king's warrant. So after having paid their score, the messenger, with the tinker striding beside his nag, started back to Nottingham again.
one bright morning, soon after this time, Robin Hood started off to Nineham Town to find what was a doing there, walking merrily along the roadside, where the grass was sweet with daisies, his eyes wandering and his thoughts also, his bugle horn hung at his hip and his bow and arrows at his back, while in his hand he bore a good stout oaken staff, which he twirled with his fingers as he strolled along. As thus he walked down a shady lane, he saw a tinker coming, trolling a merry song as he drew nigh. On his back hung his bag and his hammer, and in his hand he carried a right stout crab staff full six long, feet long, and thus sang he, Oh my goodness, I gotta do a song. This will be fun. It's Matsu singing time! Sit along with Matsu. <laughs> oh, he's a fun time, I suppose. Um, I'm trying to, I'm reading it ahead of time so I can come up with a tune. Okay. In peace got time went horn town to horn, give ears till buck be killed, and little lads with pipes of corn sit keeping peace afield. Hello, good friend, cried Robin. Cool skeleton, what's this about seeing around Matsu? I said singing along with Matsu, not seeing around Matsu, cool skeleton. No, that's not what I said. A winter gather strawberries. Hello, cried Robin again. By woods and groves feel far. Hello, art thou deaf, man? Good friend, say I. And who art thou, thou boldly check a fair son? Quoth the tinker, stopping in his sinning. Hello, thine own self, whether thou be good friend or no. But let me tell thee, thou stout fellow, chin thou be a good friend, it were well for us both. But can thou be no good friend, it were ill for thee. <laughs> then let us be good friends, quoth Jolly Robin, for ill would it be to be ill, and ill like I thine oaken staff full well to make it but well, so good friends let us be. Oi, Mary, then let us be, said the tinker. But good youth, thy tongue runneth so nimbly that my poor and heavy wits can but ill follow it. So talk more plainly, I pray, for I am a plain man, forsooth. And whence comest thou, my lusty blade? quoth Robin. I come from Banbury. Answered the tinker. Alas, quoth Robin, I hear there is sad news this very morn. Ha! Is it indeed so? cried the tinker eagerly. By thee tell it speedily, for I am a tinker my trade, as thou seest, and as I am in my trade, I am greedy for news, even as a priest is greedy for farthings. Well then, quoth Robin, list thou, and I will tell. But bear thyself up bravely, for the news is sad, I wot. Thus it is. I hear that the two tinkers are in the stocks for drinking ale and beer. Now a more sees thee, and then a news, thou scurry dog, quoth the tinker, for thou speakest but ill of good men. But sad news it is indeed. Gin there be two stout fellows in the stocks. Nay, said Robin, thou hast missed the mark, and dost but weep for the wrong sow. The sadness of the news lieth in that there be but two in the stocks, for the others do roam the country at large. Now by the pewter platter of St. Dunstan, cried the tinker, I have a good part of a mind to base thy hide, 
for thy ill chest. But sin men be put in the stocks for drinking ale and beer, I trow thou wouldst not lose thy part. Loud laughed Robin and cried, Now well taken, Tinker, well taken. Why thy wits are like beer, that do froth the most when they grow sour. But right are thou, man, for I love ale and beer right well. Therefore, come straight away with me hard by to the sign of the blue ball. And if thou drinkest as thou appearest, and I want thou wilt not belie thy looks, I will trench thy throat with as good home brewed as ever were tapped in all broad Nottinghamshire. No, my faith, by my faith, said the tinker. Thou art a right good fellow, in spite of thy scurvy jests. I love thee, my sweet chuck, and June I go not with thee till that same blue boar thou mayst call me a heathen. Tell me thy news, good friend, I pray thee, quoth Robin as they trudged along together, for tinkers, I ween, are all as full of news as an egg of meat. Now, I love thee as my brother, my bully blade, said the tinker. Else I would not tell thee my news, for sly I am, man, and I have in my hand, in hand a grave undertaking that doth call for all my wish. For I come to seek a bold outlaw that men hereabout call Robin Hood. Within my pouch I have a warrant, all fairly written out on parchment, forsooth, with a great red seal, for to make it lawful. Could I but might this shame Robin Hood, I would serve it upon his dainty body. And if he minded it not, I would beat him, till every one of his ribs would cry, Amen. But thou livest hereabouts. Myhap thou knowest, Robin Hood, thyself, good fellow. Ay, many that do I somewhat, quoth Robin. And I have seen him this very morn. But Tinker, men say that he is but a sad sly thief. Thou hadst better watch thy warrant, man, or else he may steal it out from of thy very patch. Let him more try, cried the Tinker. Slaw may he be, but slaw him or two. I would I had him here now, man to man. Oh, the irony here. And he made his heavy clutch on the spin again. Oh, what matter of man is he, lad? Mm, much like myself, said Robin, laughing. And in height and build and age nigh the same. And he hath blue eyes, too, like mine. Nay, quoth the tinker, thou art but a green youth. I thought him to be a great bearded man, not in him men. Nottingham men feared him so. Truly he is not so old, no, not, nor so stout as thou art, said Robin, but men do call him a right deft hand at quarterstaff. That may be, said the tinker, right sturdily, but I am more deft than he, for did I not overcome Simon of Ale in a fair about in the rain at Hertford Town? But if thou knowest him, my Johnny Blade, wilt thou go with me, bring me to him? For score, bright angels hath the sheriff promised me if I serve the warrant upon the knight's nice body, and ten, the, ten of them will I give to thee if thou showest me him. I'm guessing what they mean by gold angels, I'm guessing they mean coins, because I doubt they mean actual, like, golden statues of angels. Ay, that will I, quoth Robin, but show me thy warrant, man, till I see whether it be good or no. That will I not do, even to my own brother, answered the tinker. No man shall see my warrant till I sew it upon yon fellow's own body. So be it, quoth Robin, and thou show it not to me. I know not to whom thou wouldst show it. 
But here we are at the sign of the blue ball. So let us in and taste his brown October. No sweeter inn could be found in all Nottinghamshire than that of the Blue Boar. None had such lovely trees staying around, or so covered with trailing clements and sweet woodbine. None had such good beer and such humming ale, nor in winter time, when the north wind howled and snow drifted around the hedges, was there to be found elsewhere such a roaring fire as blazed upon the hearth of the blue boar. At such times might be found a goodly company of yeomen or country folks seated around the blazing hearth, banding merry jests, while roasted crabs bobbed in bowl bowls of ale upon the hearthstone. When they mean crabs, they mean apples, as noted in this. Well known was the inn to Robin Hood and his band, for there had he and s such merry companions as Little John, or Will Stutley, or young David of Doncaster, often gathered when all the forest was filled with snow. As for mine host, he knew how to keep a still tongue in his head, and to swallow his words before they passed his teeth for he knew very well which side of his bread was spread with butter, for Robin and his band were the best of customers, and paid their scores without having them chalked up behind the door. So now, when Robin Hood and the Tinker came there too and called aloud for two great pots of ale, none would have known from look or speech that the host had ever set eyes upon the outlaw before. Another drink of water. Bide thou, art, bide thou here, quoth Robin to the tinker, while I go and see that mine host draweth ale from the right butt, for he hath good October, I know, and that brewed by Whithole of Tamworth. So saying, he went within and whispered to the host to add a measure of Flemish strong waters to the good English ale, which the latter did and brought it to them. Bah, oh, lady! said the tinker, after a long draught of ale, Yon same what hoth with hole of Tamworth, a right good Saxon name too, I would have thee know, breweth the most hummy nail that e'er passed the lips of what o oh, the crab stop. Oh hello there, Celine, welcome, well met Matsu, how dost thou fare this fine morn? I fare well, pray thee. I fare well, yes, I fare well, pray thee. And how is how is thou fair, Celine? We are in the middle of reading Robin, the Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. We are probably only going to read finish. We're going to finish up this little chapter. We're probably going to stop for the night. Which means we read two chapters today. There's a lot of words in this one. And welcome, Celine. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Drink, man, drink, cried Robin, only wetting his own lips meanwhile. Ho, oh, landlord, bring my friend another pot of the same. And now for a son, my jolly blade. Silly, nothing wrong with that. The older the English, the more dense the chapters seem to get. Yes, this was written in 1883. Um, Ironically, I believe Howard Ply Plyle was not English. I think he was American, actually. But he did go to the effort of using a lot of archaic phrases in this book. Aye, that will I give thee a son, my lovely fellow, quoth the tinker, for I never tasted such oil in all my days before. But, lady, it doth make my head home even now. Aye, dame hostess, come listen. And thou wouldst hear a song, and thou too, thou bonny lass, for never seen us so well as when bright eyes do look upon me the while. Celine, Americans pretending to be British seems to always make the language deliberately awkward. Yes, I agree. They always tend to overdo the language a little bit. 
add a little too much flourish. Then he sang an ancient ballad of the time of good, good King Arthur, called The Marriage of Sir Gawain. Hey, we read Sir Gawain. Which you may sometime read yourself in stout English or of early times. And as he sang, all listened to that noble tale of noble knight and his sacrifice to his king. But long before the tinker came to the last verse, his tongue began to trip and his head to spin because of the strong waters mixed with the ale. First his tongue tripped, then it grew thick of sound. Then his head wagged from side to side, until at last he fell asleep, as though he never would waken again. Then Robin Hood laughed aloud and quickly took the warrant from out the tinker's pouch with his deft fingers. Sly art thou, tinker, quoth he, but not yet, I trow, art thou as sly as that same sly thief Robin Hood. Then he called the host to him and said, Here, good man, are ten broad shillings for the entertainment thou hast given us this day. See that thou takes good care of thy fair guest there, and when he wakes thou mayest again charge him ten shillings also, and if he hath it not, thou mayest take his bag and hammer, and even his coat in payment. Thus do I punish those that come to the greenwood to deal dull to me. As for thine own self, never knew I, I landlord yet that I would not charge twice, and he could. At this the host smiled slyly, as though saying to himself the rustic saw, Teach a magpie to suck eggs. The tinker slept until the afternoon drew to a close, and the shadows grew long beside the woodland edge, and then he awoke. First he looked up, then he looked down, then he looked east, and then he looked west, for he was gathering his wits together, like barley straws blown apart by the wind. First he thought of his merry companion, but he was gone. Then he thought of his stout crab staff, and that he had within his hand. Then of his warrant, and of the fourscore angels he was to gain from serving it upon Robin Hood. He thrust his hand into his pouch, but not a scrap nor a farthing was there. Then he sprang to his feet in a rage. Ho, oh, landlord, cried he, whither hath thy knave gone that was with me but now? Selene, gathering his wits together like barley scattered to the wind. Well, that does sound like me before coffee. <laughs> I have been there. I have been there. What knave meaneth your worship? quoth the landlord, calling the tinker worship to soothe him as a man would pour oil upon angry water. I saw no knave with your worship, for I swear no man would dare call that man knave so nigh to Sherwood Forest. A right stout yeoman I saw with your worship, but I thought that your worship knew him, for few there be about here that pass him by and know him not. No, how should I, that ne'er have squealed in your sty, know all the swine therein? Who was he then, and thou knowest him so well? Why, thy, why yon same is a right stout fellow whom men hereabouts do call Robin Hood, which say, No, by our lady, cried the tinker hastily in a deep voice like an angry bull. No, didst see him come into thine ill? I, a staunch honest craftsman, who never told me who my company was, well knowing thine own self who he was. Now, I have a right round piece of a mind to crack thy knave's pate for thee. Then he took up his cudgel and looked at the landlord as though he would smite him when, where he stood. Cool Skeleton, hooray, I finished with project work for the day. Wonderful, Cool Skeleton, that's exciting. Your project will, I'm sure, is going to be amazing. Nay, nay, cried the host, throwing up his elbow, for he feared the blow. 
How knew I that thou knewest him not? Celine, not sure I was able to make out that threat he just made. One second, dear scholars. <laughs> Sorry about that, my dear scholars. I thought something was at the door. Um, let me see. I need to find that, that, uh, Celine, not sure I was able to make out that threat to, he just made. Give me one second, I need to hydrate again. Okay, so the threat he makes was... Now I have a right round piece of a mind to crack thy knave's pate for thee. Basically, he is threatening to take his quarterstaff and slam it on top of the uh, landlord's head. Nay, nay, cried the host, throwing up his elbow, for feared the blow. How knew I that thou knewest him not? Well, and truly thankful mayst thou be quoth the tinker, that I may be a patient man, and so do spare thy bald crown, else would thou sneer cheat a customer again. But as for this same knave Robin Hood, I'll go straight away seek him, and if I do not score his knave's pat, cut my staff into... I'm not going to say this word, because it would... It, it means sticks, bundle of sticks or smaller sticks, but I'm not going to say the word because I don't want to get in trouble. Because it, it, it has, its mean has changed. Got my stuff in the sticks and call me woman. So saying, he gathered himself together to depart. Nay, quoth the landlord, standing in front of him and holding out his arms like a goose herd driving his flock, for money made him bold. Thou goest not till thou hast paid me my score. But did, but, 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 but did he not pay thee? Not so much as one farthing, and ten good shillings worth of ale have ye drunk this day. Nay, I say, thou goest not away without paying me, else shall our good sheriff know of it. But nor have I to pay thee with, good fellow? Quoth the tinker, "Good fellow, not my," said the landlord. "Good fellow, am I not when it con cometh to lose ten shillings? Pay me that thou owes me in broad money, or else leave thy coat and bag and hammer. Yet I wot that I wot they are not worth ten shillings, and I shall lose thereby. Nay, and thou stirrest, I have great dog within, and I will loose him upon thee." Mike and open, Mike and open thou the door and let forth Brian if this fellow stirs one step. No, 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 quoth the tinker, for by roaming the country he had learned what dogs were. Take thou what thou wilt have, and let me depart a piece, and may a murrain go with thee. Oh, la lord, and I'll catch ye, and, and I'll catch yon scurvy valet. I'll swear he shall pay full with usury for that he hath had. So saying, he strode toward the forest, talking to himself, while the landlord and his worthy dame and Macon stood looking after him and laughed when he had fairly gone. Roman and I have stripped yon ass of his pack, may neatly, quoth the landlord. Now it happened upon this time that Robin Hood was going through the forest to Fost Way to see what was to be seen there. 
for the moon was full and the night gave promise to being bright. In his hand he carried his stout oaken staff, and at his side hung his bugle horn, and thus he walked up a forest path, whistling down another. As thus he walked up a forest path, whistling down another path came the tinker, muttering to himself and shaking his head like an angry bull, and so at a sudden bend they met sharply face to face. Each stood still for a time, and then Robin spoke. Hello, my sweet bird, said he, laughing merrily. How likest thou thy nail? Wilt not s sing to me another song? The tinker said nothing at first, but stood looking at Robin with a grim face. No, quoth he at last. I'm rock glad I have met thee, and if I do not rattle thy bones within thy hide this day, I'll give thee leave to put thy foot upon my neck. With all my heart, cried Merry Robin, rattle my bones, and thou canst. So saying, he gripped his staff and threw himself upon his guard. Then the tinker spat upon his hands, and grasping his staff came straight at the other. He struck two or three blows, but soon found that he had met his match, for Robin warded and parried all of them. Before the tinker thought, he gave him a rap upon the ribs in return. At this Robin laughed aloud, and the tinker grew more angry than ever, and smote again with all his might and main. Again Robin warded two of the strokes, but at the third his staff broke beneath the mighty blows of the tinker. Now ill betide thee, traitor staff, cried Robin as he fell as it fell from his hands. A foul stick art thou to serve me thus in mine hour of need. No yield thee, quoth the tinker. For thou art more captive, and thou doth do not, I will beat thy pat to a pudding. To this Robin Hood made no answer, but clapping his horns to his lips, he blew three blasts loud and clear. Hey, quoth the tinker, blow thou must, but go thou must with me to Nottingham Town, for the sheriff would fain see thee there. Now wilt thou yield thee, or shall I have to break thy pretty head? And I must drink stout ale, I must, quoth Robin, but never have I yielded me to a man before, and that without wound or mark upon my body, nor when I bethink thee will I yield now. Ho! My merry men, come quickly! Then from out the forest leapt Little John and six stout yeomen clad in Lincoln green. Oh no, good master! cried Little John, What need hast thou thy, that thou dost wind thy horn so loudly? There stands a tinker, quoth Robin, that would fain take me to Nottingham, there to hang upon the gallows tree. Then shall I, he himself hang forthwith, cried Little John, and he and the other other, he and the others made at the tinker to seize him. Nay, touch him not, said Robin, for a right stout man is he. A metal man he is by trade, and a metalled man by nature, moreover. He doth sing a lovely ballad. Say, good fellow, wilt thou join my merry men all? Three suits of Lincoln green shalt thou have a year, beside twenty marks in fee. Thou shalt share all with us, and lead a right merry life in the greenwood. For cares have we not, and misfortune cometh not upon us within the sweet shades of Sherwood, where we shoot the dun deer, and feed upon venison and sweet oaten cakes and curds and honey. Wilt thou come with me? Aye, many will I join with you all, quoth the tinker, for I love a merry life, and I love thee, good master, though thou didst whack my ribs and cheat me into the bargain. Fain am I to own thou art about both a stouter and a slyer man than I, so I will obey thee, be thine own true servant. That was a quick turnover. So all turned their steps to the forest depths, where the tinker was to live henceforth. For many a day he said sang ballads to the band, until the famous Alan a Dale joined them, before whose sweet voice all others seemed as harsh as a raven's. But of him we will learn hereafter. And we will stop there for the night, my dear scholars. Oh, well, what did you think of those merry adventures? I will admit, 
reading this language, the way it's written, is a ton twister. And it, I, there are a couple times, as you can tell, I was fumbling over the words. Um, not sure how I feel about Howard P Pale choosing to write like this. It's very difficult. But it's fun at the same time. Especially if you're like me who reads characters. You really get into it. The Tinker story was interesting. I I think I had recalled him joining Robin Hood, but just the fact that it's like, that it's very much, I'm here to arrest you. Oh no, I'm going to join you. It was like a very quick turnover. It, it feels like he's being essentially held hostage. Oh, thank you for the hydrate, Celine. Um, but yes. Um, so, next week. Um, so Sunday, I don't know what's going on with the Dracula collab. It might be happening. I have to check with my fellow collab collaborators. I think that's the word. But next week, if everything goes according to plan, Tuesday we will be continuing our playthrough of Psychonauts. It's getting really exciting. Um, and then Thursday, we will be reading more of The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood. So let's see who we can raid tonight. I think for tonight, a lot of people are streaming. We will raid, I think, Sophia, since she suggested this book. Um, she is also reading today uh, The Lost Prince. I think she's finishing it up tonight. So then, my dear scholars... I say unto you, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Till we meet each other again at the study, take care, and I shall see you next time. Till then, farewell, and bye-bye. <laughs>